Hello, and welcome to Vendor Trash. Is the title a reference to my opinions, my drawing skills, or both? That's for you to decide. Today, I want to discuss the concept of meaningful RP choices within WoW. Now, outside of our character customizations and transmog, we actually don't have a ton of that. And it's at least somewhat understandable why that is. If you allow the player characters to sort of choose their own story, then that means you have to support more than one story. That's why with most video games that try to do this, it's more of an illusion of choice. Pretty much whatever you do is going to circle back to the same conclusion. Also, WoW is an MMORPG. There has to be a canonical flow to events, and it cannot realistically differ by player. That being said, there are ways to give players unique experiences based on their choices. Heck, one of the most fundamental is just having different quests based on whether you're Horde or Alliance. Something that's pretty much disappeared from the game at this point. It's something that I think they absolutely should go back to, and I think would be well worth the resources. Even if you're opposed to the idea of faction conflict, that doesn't mean the factions have to be identical. But there have also been many other smaller forms of player choice throughout the history of WoW's narrative. So first things first, I'm gonna run through all of them that I can remember. Going back to Vanilla, we had the simple reputation choice between Magrum and Gelki Centaur in Desilus. The concept was simple, any quests you did for one would decrease your rep with the other. Likewise, killing members of one clan would decrease your rep with that one and increase your rep with the other. There weren't massive differences between the two, it was basically the Magrum being the brutish clan and the Gelkis clan being the more sophisticated one. There weren't any real rewards for picking either side, and with the quest changes that came with Cataclysm, you now just get exalted with both of them by doing the quest chain. Also from Vanilla, we had the much more memorable Steamweedle vs. Bloodsail reputation. This one was a bit more complicated as the Steamweedle cartel had four reps tied to it. Basically, you had to choose, did you want that pirate hat or did you want life to not be miserable in any goblin town? So yeah, if you went blood sale, you were doing so very deliberately and making a statement. I don't remember if it was always possible to get exalted with all five of them, but if it was, I know it was an incredible feat at the time. These reputations are also probably the most notorious part of the insane in the membrane achievement. That one requires you to have exalted with all of the goblin factions as well as honored with the blood sale buccaneers, as well as exalted with several other relatively grindy reputations. Nowadays, getting exalted with all five of them isn't too bad. It basically boils down to killing guards in Booty Bay until you're exalted with the blood sail, and then grinding mobs in Tanaris that do grant Steam Weedle rep without taking away your blood sail rep, all the way from hated back up to exalted. It's really not difficult, anybody can do it, you just need to sit down and grind it out. Get a group, drop some rep banners, and plug away. Moving on to the Burning Crusade, we had the infamous Aldor versus Scryer's choice. After first making your way to Shatrath City and having the very quick tour with Cadgar's servant, you get to choose whether you side with a bunch of Blood Elves or a bunch of Draenei. And as anyone who remembers Jimmy, the World of Warcraft story knows, this is the most important decision you will ever make and it could end your friendship forever. But no, in reality, the consequences of your choice were pretty trivial. You had some different rep rewards, but I don't think any of them were of particularly high quality. And if you wanted to grind rep, you had different turn-in items. But really, the biggest differences were A, just which section of Shatrath you hung out in, and B, you had different hubs in Shadowmoon Valley. If at any point you wanted to switch your loyalty, you were free to do so. You just had to buy or grind out a ton of venom sacks or something else for the other side. So your choice wasn't wholly permanent, but you had to work if you regretted it, which I'm actually in favor of. Personally, on my main, I went with the Aldor. Even as a Horde player, I was always a big fan of Draenei, and this was a rare chance to sort of side with them on something. They also had an exclusive pathway into Nagrand, which only mattered until you could fly and the Elevator of Death. That, and there was the fact that the Scryers were basically a subgroup of Kale's Blood Elves that had broken off and were rebelling against him, and I happen to think Kale's pretty cool, so screw them. In Wrath of the Lich King, we would have another, and what would wind up being the last, of the binary rep choices. Questing through Sholazar Basin would give you the opportunity to experience life with both the Frenzy Heart Wolvar tribe and the Gorlock Oracles. At the end of the quest chain, you would confront a Lich who was prepared to kill a member of both tribes, and ultimately you have to choose which one you want to save. This choice would set you at honored with one of them and hated with the other. Then the rest of the rep grind was pretty much doing dailies. Again, it it was possible to change your choice afterwards if you regretted it. 
uh, this time in the form of a daily quest, but it's not going to be a quick turnover. This particular choice wasn't super meaningful to me. I felt about equal affinity for both tribes, although as I recall, the frenzy hearts were kind of bullies to the oracles. Ultimately, I made this choice based on the fact that I wanted the green proto drake, which you could only get from the oracles, and never really saw a reason to change it. Again, a pretty inconsequential choice in the long run, but a nice little bit of flavor. After this, narrative choice for the player pretty much disappeared entirely until Battle for Azeroth. If you were a horde player at the time, you were given the infamous Sourfang vs Sylvanas, or Rebel vs Loyalist choice. I believe initially on the PTR, you just had to go along with Sourfang's route, but there was enough of a community outcry that they did eventually add the Sylvanas choice. But it became apparent very quickly, and remained that way, that there was only one option that they wanted you to go with. Pretty consistently, if you went the Loyalist route, you either wound up skipping quests, or were told by Sylvanas or Nathanas to just play along. And if that didn't make it obvious what you're supposed to do, the 23 minutes of Sour Fang cinematics did. And there was also the fact that at multiple points you had the option to switch from being a loyalist to a rebel, but you didn't have the option to go the other way. As I've said before, I appreciate that we got the choice at all, but could have fleshed it out a little bit more. If my memory is correct, I believe Rebels got a tabard or something of the sort, and Loyalists didn't get any tangible reward, although we did get some follow-up quests. And to Blizzard's credit, that wasn't completely abandoned after Battle for Azeroth. I want to say when they added the Forsaken Heritage quest, they also added a very small quest in Orgrimmar, where you get a message from Sylvanas. Hilariously enough, it's delivered to you by one of Taronda's Sentinel Owls, which why? Why would it run that little errand for her? It's weird. I guess I'm just gonna headcanon that it grew really attached to Sylvanas during her penance in the Maw, and now they're just like besties. Now, I of course sided with Sylvanas, which is the only right thing to do, but I think it would have been neat if there was more actual gameplay impact for both loyalists and rebels. Like, give us some way to show off our choices. Now, I know a lot of Alliance players were upset that Horde were getting that extra bit of choice, and they weren't. And I agree, the Alliance should have had a choice. A commonly floated one at the time was choosing between Anduin and Toronda, who would basically be the peace-seeking or warmongering options. Granted, the best thing Blizzard could have done was just write BFA way better, but I digress, this isn't the video for that. BFA also offered another choice in the form of the Gift of Nazoth, which would be acquired by all players normally just doing the Crucible of Storms quest chain. It put a little Nazoth eyeball on top of your head, caused you to hear occasional whispers, understand Shathyar, and gave you a small number of unique NPC dialogues. You're pretty much instantly called out for having this on and are redirected to someone who can purge it from you, but you don't actually have to do that, so many of us just held on to it because honestly our characters being loyal to the old gods just seems kind of fun, doesn't it? There was also a neat little secret society aspect to it, where if you purged your eye, you couldn't tell who had it, but if you did have it on, you could see who else was still in the cool kids club. The main downside to this was just the fact that you always had this eyeball above your head. It was kind of annoying, especially if you weren't rocking a purple transmog. A lot of us held out for so long, waiting for there to be some tangible reward for not purging it. That never actually came, so when Shadowlands rolled around, I finally removed the thing. Although I hear it only shows up in BFA content anyway, so it wouldn't have even been that big of a deal, I'm sorry. And if you do purge it, you are given a toy that lets you put the cosmetic eye back up temporarily. So BFA brought some fun ideas of choice, but didn't really follow through on them that well. Shadowlands, on the other hand, would be both the high and low point for this concept. I'm speaking, of course, of the infamous Covenant system. It was one of the big box features of the expansion, having you choose between the Kyrian of Bastion, the Necrolords of Maldraxxus, the Night Fae of Ardenweald, and the Venthyr of Revendreth. Never before since your choice of class has your decision had such an impact on your gameplay. On the flavor side of things, this was amazing. Your covenant choice basically determined where you hung out for the expansion. Were you AFKing at Elysian Hold, at the Seat of the Primus, the Heart of the Forest, or at Sinfall? There were also tons of unique cosmetic rewards, ranging from transmogs, to pets, to mounts, to hearthstones. And eventually all of the covenant cosmetics were made account-wide anyways, and for the most part I support this, especially with the mounts, 
but it would be nice to have some sort of exclusive item. Furthermore, each covenant had their own unique campaign, although sometimes these would intersect in interesting ways. You basically interacted with a unique set of characters, and had other fun perks, like having an advanced travel network that you could use to zip around your home zone much faster than other players. They also stuck these neat little things inside of the original Eight Shadowlands dungeons, that you would need a player of a specific covenant to activate, obviously two dungeons per covenant. These would encourage your M plus group to diversify their covenant choices, although not absolutely require it. One of my favorite of these little things was Venthyr being able to control the Gargans in Halls of Atonement. Again, these weren't huge, but when you got to do them, you felt pretty cool. It's like when a rogue opens the door in Shattered Halls. Although these weren't rendered pointless by your entire party jumping down the hole because they're just used to doing so. And on top of all of this, each covenant had its own little mini game feature. The Kyrian had the Path of Ascension game, where basically you controlled vehicle versions of Pelagos, Clea, or Makonos, and would face off against one of 10 different encounters on one of four different difficulties. There was a lot to it. Personally, I only did enough to get all of the mounts I needed from it, but it's a neat little feature. Necrolords could engage in the Abomination Factory, which basically let them turn a bunch of parts that they scavenged into different abominations. These would both offer you different quests, as well as serve a variety of other functions, like carrying you around on their back. If you were Night Fae, you had access to the Queen's Conservatory, which was basically just a modern version of the Half Hill Farm. You would plant dream seeds, then infuse them to either increase their yield, quality, or speed, and then loot either crafting materials or transmog and the like. It felt like the most bare bones of them all, but it was still pretty cool. But the best of them all, in my opinion, was the Ember Court for Venthyr. On a weekly cooldown, you would be able to host your own party on top of Sinfall. There were 16 different guests you could invite, and build friendship reputation with, and you better believe I'm best friends with all of them. Each of these guests had their own set of preferences about what kind of party they enjoy. They could like messy or clean, they could like safe or dangerous, humble or decadent, relaxing or exciting, and casual or formal. Ultimately, you wouldn't be able to please everybody on every front for every party, so you had to make some smart choices. Or make some dumber choices and just take longer to get to best friend status. These choices included both which guests you invited to which party, and which of the many little side activities you did during the Ember Court. I cannot understate how much I cared about this fun little game. Now I will acknowledge that it was probably more fun because I was doing it on my main. If I was doing it on an alt, it probably would have been a bit of a headache. But yeah, all in all, Covenants were an amazing injection of flavor and player choice. I liken them a bit to the class hall quests from Legion. These of course were different based on your class, and it made leveling alts in that expansion very refreshing. With Covenants in Shadowlands, it meant you could tap into four different experiences. So when people complain about Shadowlands not having a ton of content, I have to assume they were actually skipping out on a lot. Granted, that criticism is not applicable to complaints about the fact that there were only three raid tiers. And in fact, all the effort that went into Covenants may have been partially responsible for that, similar to Garrison's in WAD. Also, my friends and I kept theorizing about if they would add another Covenant at some point. A fifth option to join Sylvanas in the Mossworn would have been a hard choice for me. But yeah, it's no secret that Covenants had a major downside. This of course being that every Covenant gave a different utility spell, and every Covenant class combination gave a different throughput spell. On top of that, every Covenant gave three different soulbinds that could further modify how your class played. It was an absolute puzzle box of balancing, and most people agreed that they never got it quite right. Like, most specs had agreed upon one or two Covenants that you were supposed to go with. And of course, very often, those covenants weren't necessarily the one you would have chosen for RP reasons. Now this whole debate landed me in a very peculiar spot. Pretty much out of the gate, I knew I wanted to go with the Venthyr. That's what I did wind up going with, and I enjoyed the ability that I had, Mirrors of Torment, and at no point did I ever switch covenants. Now I'm not entirely sure, but I think I was fortunate enough that Venthyr was always at least a viable covenant choice for Frostmage, but I remember insisting that I wouldn't change anyways, and insisting that other players shouldn't have to change either. Not a popular opinion, I know, but I wasn't about to betray my awesome gothic BDSM buddies just because some raid simulator or class guide said I should. I admit it was probably a bit of a selfish stance, but I also don't regret that stance. Anyway, Blizzard of course implemented a system that would allow you to change covenants after your initial choice. At implementation, 
This wasn't even that strict in my opinion. It would take a day or two at most to switch, and this was far less to do with any grinds than it was just cooldowns that Blizzard had implemented. Yet even in this state, people hated it and said it was way too restrictive. So Blizzard kept loosening the rules on it until eventually you were able to switch in a matter of minutes. And I hated this, I hated that there was no sense of loyalty or actual choice. And I get it, I get how frustrating it is if you just want to perform better and are locked behind some arbitrary wall, but that's just not the thing I cared most about in this situation. But yeah, oddly enough, because of this compromise situation, for most of the expansion, nobody was actually happy. You had the people who wanted complete fluidity and weren't getting it, and then you had the loons like me who wanted almost complete rigidity and weren't getting that either. At the end of the day, what we can all agree on is that Covenants should have just been a purely cosmetic choice. With the little gimmicks in each of the dungeons, being about as far as they should have gone with gameplay impact. I think just about everybody would have been happier with that scenario. Anyway, before Dragonflight was officially announced, it was pretty broadly speculated that the Dragon Isles was where we were gonna go, which obviously led to tons of speculation and fake leaks. And very common among these fake leaks was the idea of a covenant system for the Dragon Flights. It'd be very easy to imagine a system where you pledge your loyalty to one of the five. And I have very little doubt that Blizzard considered this at some point. If they just stripped away all of the power aspects of the system, it would have worked fine. It's just that at that point, people were so antagonistic to the very idea of covenants that they knew it wouldn't fly. I would have loved to see it though, partly because going into Dragonflight, I didn't really have a favorite, and by the end of it, I found myself surprisingly attached to the blues. This had a lot to do with both the simulacrum of Cindergosa and the whole Blue Dawn quest chain. I enjoyed Senegos and Stelagosa, and even Caligos, who historically I have given a ton of flack to. I feel like this expansion finally brought him into his own. Granted, I don't love him, but I don't hate him like I once did. I should also point out that there was one small element of choice in whether you supported Rathian or Sibelian, but ultimately these weren't exclusive, you just chose one per week and could eventually max out your rep with both of them, so it doesn't really count. In conclusion, Blizzard. Please let us have more choice. Just tiny little noticeable perks, it doesn't have to be major gameplay stuff. Let me have exclusive access to this questing hub that other players don't because they made a different choice. Any little thing to make me feel like the RP choices for my character didn't end when I hit create character. And though the execution of it all may not have been perfect, thank you for all of the effort and love that was put into Covenants. For today's drawing, I decided to go with Lady Moonberry of the Night Fae. I don't think she's my favorite character from Shadowlands, but she's up there. I like that she's simultaneously one of the most playful characters of the Covenant, and one of the most powerful. I always interpreted her as basically being the second command of the Night Fae after the Winter Queen, as well as being probably the third most powerful Night Fae. I guess I can't say for sure, but I just feel like Izera probably eclipses her in that regard. But yeah, an absolutely delightful character. The world building in the initial Shadowland zones was actually pretty phenomenal. There was so much cultural stuff going on with all of the Covenants, and so many lovable characters were introduced. And naturally, I set her in Ardenweald, which was actually a bit tricky for me not to draw, but just to color in because that zone has so many particle effects that I felt not representing them in some capacity would just be selling the place short. So yeah, I think that about wraps things up here. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next week. Bye bye